Finally, in this review, the overall aim is to move away from the industrial model of cities in which power comes from inefficient centralised power stations outside urban areas belching out pollutants, where products are consumed and thrown to waste in landfill, where fossil fuel-based fertilisers are used to grow food and huge noisy freeways cut through city areas with hard landscape and fast water runoff. The new direction is towards places which will be sustainable. That means from an environmental, social, economic and most importantly a cultural point of view. A place where communities and food production are protected from flooding, where water and waste are reused locally, where people can walk, cycle and use public transport and everything runs on renewables. In our industrial development model, energy consumption grows proportionately to GDP. Consumption eventually levels off as manufacturing is offshored to low and middle income countries. The difference you can see in energy consumption now between USA and Europe is mostly car use in low density sprawling urban US centres. In the ecological age model being pursued by China, they are aiming to flatten their energy growth line by 20% now. They intend to do this using the eco-city urbanisation model combined with building high-speed rail lines and moving to energy-efficient manufacturing. Competition for land in most urban areas is driving up the land part of house prices and inequalities are widening. The ambitions of those moving to urban centres in low- and middle-income countries are not being realised. People move to cities not because they will be better off, but because they expect to be better off. Many people actually find it hard to integrate and make their way. Their dire financial situation and lack of affordable housing, exacerbated by rising fuel and food costs, is often leading to homelessness and slum housing. The slum population is forecast to rise to 1.4 billion by 2020, with Africa most affected. The approach to city living needs to change radically to a much more efficient use of land if we're to live within the carrying capacity of the planet. Ecological this is that for the world's most vulnerable people, in countries like Afghanistan and Bangladesh, who spend 60% of their income on food, are being priced out of the food market and are facing starvation. As wealth increases, people eat more and eat high footprint food like meat, which increases pressure on water supply. Productivity of land for vegetables and fruit can be improved using new low energy processes of building and balancing soil fertility. And this can be assisted by closing the resource loops between urban living and rural food production, which I'll come back to later. Freshwater resources are fundamental to agriculture, food production and human development. If present trends continue, 1.8 billion people will be living in countries or regions with absolute water scarcity by 2025, and two-thirds of the world population could be subject to water stress. Europe has this problem too, as you can see in dark green. This is caused primarily by abstracting too much, wasting what we have, polluting our water sources and deforestation. Agriculture is to blame for a lot of this. In the UK, we have critical water scarcity in the southeast of England. A major opportunity is to treat urban wastewater and use it for drip feed irrigation of surrounding farmland. Also, we can collect and store rainwater and use it as grey water for secondary uses. Slowing runoff in this way can help mitigate increased rainfall intensity from climate change and reduce the investments needed to cope with that. Now moving to energy. If current trends continue, the world's primary energy demand will more than double by 2030. Almost half of that will be accounted for by energy demand in India and China alone. In the UK, 90% of the energy we use comes from fossil fuels. Two-thirds of energy is wasted through inefficiency in generation, distribution, supply and usage, and this provides an opportunity for improved performance. Moving to fuels, coal consumption is rising faster than oil and gas, with global demand forecast to jump 70% between 2005 and 2030. Coal-powered stations are being built all over the world despite the threat of emission caps because coal is now the cheapest, most plentiful fossil fuel we have left and could last beyond oil and gas. Carbon capture and storage, plus new coal gasification technologies, offer the opportunity to reduce emissions from coal power stations, and more of that later. 
nuclear power and gas power will have a continued important role to play in the energy supply mix. There are limits to sources of raw material supply here too though, and prices of raw materials will inevitably rise. Now moving to oil, where there is a future prospect of supplies which cannot keep up with demand. We are now using much more every year than we're discovering, and so the controversial concept of peak oil has emerged. We're now passing the peak of oil reserves as shown here, and oil price has increased fourfold in seven years. Oil price does not just impact our transport costs, but directly impacts food and goods prices too. Energy from renewable sources, such as solar, wind, tides and waves, are greatly underused, and are becoming more viable as oil prices increase. There is much more solar energy available in the desert regions of the world than we're currently generating from fossil fuels. According to the 2006 United Nations Environment Report, an area of 640,000 square kilometres could provide the world with all of its electricity needs, and the Sahara is more than 9 million square kilometres in size. We have to be willing to build the infrastructure to transfer the desert power into our urban centres, and this is actually starting in California for the US and in Algeria for Europe. Footprint is changed fundamentally by the level of urban density and how people live. Food and goods are things consumers can influence, but urban density, mix of uses and fuel choice are largely planning decisions. So good urban design and planning is critical to a successful change of direction and this needs clear legal structures for land use. It's important then to understand the significance of urban density for reducing transport energy demand. An average US urban dweller uses about 24 times more energy annually in private transport as a Chinese urban resident. You can see from the graph that there is a sweet spot of urban density of 35 to 100 people per hectare where public transport is viable and there's plenty of room for urban parks and gardens. So choosing the right density is really important. So what are the big issues and opportunities for resource efficiency in food, water, energy and raw materials? Let's look at food first. As population grows and climate change impacts on us, the area of productive land is actually reducing. The flood in Burma shows how vulnerable food producing areas actually are. Also, deterioration of soil quality and overgrazing are reducing the productivity on what land we have left, forcing us to use more chemical fertilisers and more fossil fuels. And yet, we still cannot meet the demand. The imbalance between supply and demand is now driving up food prices. Consumption is outstripping production. The food stocks normally reserved for future use are actually being used now. This has been made worse by competition in land use for growing biofuels and also by fossil fuel price hikes. A desperate consequence of this, let's look at materials. Raw material consumption is rising very fast and the extraction of minerals comes at an environmental price with mining stripping more of the earth's surface each year than natural erosion. At a typical bauxite mine, 10 tonnes of waste rock and 3 tonnes of toxic mud are generated to produce just 1 tonne of aluminium. But looking forward, the largest potential metal mines in the world are now in the buildings, products and infrastructure of existing urban centres, which we can refashion to our ecological age needs. Finally, before I go on to the ways of putting these ideas into practice, I want to emphasise the importance of prioritising adaptation to climate change. More and more people live in coastal areas and they have increasing exposure to floods and cyclones. In all areas, Droughts and floods are affecting food production and prices, and higher summer temperatures in urban centres are creating dangerous conditions for the young, elderly and infirm. Many of the nations and regions most at risk from the impacts of climate change are low- and middle-income nations that have contributed very little to greenhouse gases.